thanks, Peter, and, and thanks for the, the invite to, to speak uh, this morning on the, uh, the round table. Um, also looking forward to contributions uh, from Diego and, and Julie. So what I'd like to talk about briefly uh, this morning is, is around developing a, a value framework uh, for your organization. And I'll discuss how, how this links to the, the topic of the roundtable discussion today around decision-making frameworks. I guess the, the first place to start is a, a little discussion about what is value. And um, when I'm speaking to uh, my clients, um, I often find um, a picture that's not too dissimilar to this. Uh, every, everyone often has a, a different view around what is value for them, for their part of the organization, for their, the stakeholders that they are, uh, are most interested in. And what we find um, is a, a crucial part of a decision-making process is trying to get alignment around what the organization sees as the, the key elements that, that drive value for the organization. Peter already mentioned uh, the, the PAS 55 standard for asset management. Um, and uh, we work closely with lots of organizations who are looking to improve their management systems, whether that's uh, PAS 55 or ISO 55000. And central to that is, of course, the, the, the topic of, of asset management and how we manage our assets. If we just consider a few of the definitions according to the ISO 55000 standard. Assets exist to provide value to the organizations and its stakeholders. This value can be tangible or intangible, financial or non-financial, and ultimately will be determined by the organizations and its stakeholders in accordance with the organizational objectives. And the link uh, to the round table this morning, and as part of this, this includes the establishment of decision-making processes uh, that reflect stakeholder need, need and define value. And this comes from the, the overview sent section at the beginning of the ISO 55000 standard. Just to give you a few examples of how different organizations approach this, this challenge. Many of you will be familiar with the risk matrix. A number of organizations use uh, risk-based approaches wanting to understand different risk factors around safety risks, reliability risks, environmental risks, and understanding how to align those different risk factors so that they can understand whether a major risk from a safety perspective, how does that align to a major risk um, from an environmental perspective? Here in the UK, um, all of the distribution organizations have recently uh, grouped together to develop a common framework risk monetization. Again, an excellent way of understanding how to align different risk factors. Um, and the, the common framework that the UK organizations have um, really supports a very analytical way to understand, based on different factors, different, different um, characteristics of their assets and their condition, how does that relate to the risk and how does that risk change over time. Other customers we've worked with um, developed more user-based input, wanting to un get understand from their, from their engineers out in the field how they value different interventions or investments in their network. And so we often work with organizations to develop these questionnaires to support the evaluation um, of, of different candidate investments. And there's also always a lot of uh, I've, talked, I've given some examples of some risk frameworks and some, some, some value models. Um, and a lot of this, there's also the organization it itself has financial criteria they're looking to, um, looking to respect, whether that comes from their regulator, their stakeholders. Um, in the UK, again, uh, a lot of, a lot of, uh, kind of business case analysis are governed by the, the Green Book from the, the Treasury perspective. And as I, um, I, I work with clients all over Europe, there's lots of our examples that are very specific to uh, different regulatory contexts or different um, 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 financial regimes that your organizations are worked under. What I wanted to just talk a little bit about is 
um, what we see as Copper Leaf and, and how we approach this challenge of defining value and using it to enhance the decision-making processes within the organizations we work with. So I'm going to talk about a couple of elements of what we call a, a value framework. Um, the first is everything has to be driven from the strategic objectives of the organization. That goes back to the definition from an ISO perspective. Why are we looking after these assets? What value do they bring the organization? And so typically we see a number of agreed definitions, whether that's agreed definitions for risk, for service measures, for financial frameworks. Do we understand the level of service and what does that mean to our customers? And organizations are, are typically trying to establish what we call value models to, to make this link between the, the different KPIs from a, um, a, uh, an operational context in their assets and linking that, getting the line of sight to the strategic objectives. And these, ma these models often result in a number of different measures. These are, the, these are the, the KPIs that the organization is interested in following because it's going to help them define their investment or their management strategies. And these value measures can include risk, service measure, the health and condition of your assets, what benefit, um, both financial and non-financial, non um, uh, can interventions in your network bring to the organization. And of course, you have to consider what are your resources available, both financial and manpower, in terms of um, making sure that any, any of the decisions you make you're able to implement them within the organization. A very important factor when you're considering making decisions in your network is the concept of time. Assets typically are degrading, and so the, the value an asset can bring to the organization today or a certain risk will typically change over time. And that makes this a very dynamic pro a problem to solve, understanding when is the best time to intervene, to maintain, to invest your assets? And what we see is all of these value measures, having this full understanding of these measures over time, what we're wanting to do is to support the decision-making process. So some of these value measures will, will kind of flow into the value function of the organization. Others may be used to constrain a, 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 an investment plan development process. Have we got the right resources, or are we achieving the right service or risk mitigation levels in certain areas? And of course, everyone wants to be able to report to understand uh, how these are changing over time. I think it's important to note one of the kind of discussion topics Peter proposed to us was around um, the data and the data analytics required to support this process. What we see is that there's often a combination of both some automated analytics that can take the, the information you have on your assets and combine that information to determine risk models and understand the, um, the, the consequence of, 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 different, of different failures. But often there's a, a large amount of human assessment of required as well. I don't think this is it's typically big data that's required. Um, but just some of the core asset-related data that you typically have within your organizations today. And all of this is flowing to try and get that link between the strategic objectives, the understanding of value, and enabling you to make the appropriate decisions. It's not something which, having set up a decision-making criteria, that that's what you're going to stick with for the next 10 years. There's always an element of continuous improvement as you become more mature, as you're learning about your frameworks that you develop. I had thought I would play a small video today. Um, some of the uh, technical elements um, and was perhaps too risky. Um, but we, we do have a couple of cartoons which provide a very light-hearted way of understanding some of the key concepts that I'm sure we're all going to discuss today. And uh, the, the second episode in the the adventures of Coop and C55 uh, talks very much around developing a value framework. So um, please take a, take a look at those in your, in your own time. Just an example here of a, a value framework. And this is, this is a framework we, we developed um, with a, a European uh, distribution organization 
Um, a number of the elements have been slightly changed to um, respect the anonymity of the, of the client. But wanting to understand that these different value measures often flow into a number of categories. We're wanting to understand risks. We're wanting to understand different benefits we get from the organization. And I think if you, if you look at this example here, there's, there's some elements which I'm, I'm sure you're, you're all already thinking about. The environmental risk or the quality of delivery, the various measures below that. Um, but when, when we build these frameworks with our clients, we, we also want to understand some of the perhaps more intangible uh, benefits and risks. Things like public perception benefit, um, cyber security risk. How do you value those and how do you bring those into your, into your decision-making framework? And when, once you've developed this framework, it then provides the rules, it provides a consistent and transparent process to help you make decisions into when you should refurbish or maintain or replace an asset, when you should um, potentially grow the network. Well, in fact, you can use this across your, your whole investment portfolio for developments, for investments in IT, in fleet, um, even in IT projects. What you're looking to understand is the different benefits these different investments will give you. And having an alignment on, on, a, on a common scale, typically a monetized scale, although some people prefer to uh, trade in value points or risk points as well. So what you're able to do is consider different projects, different candidate interventions, and evaluate how they contribute to the, the values of your organization. And different projects will contribute different, different value in different areas. And so it's not the case that you have to have to consider every project and think, oh, how is this project going to be influence the, the brand of my organization? It's about taking a pragmatic approach and, um, and understanding the, 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 the key areas we need to evaluate your different projects for. But what it does mean is you're allowed to, you're then able to have a consistent process um, across the organization. And if I take you back to that picture at the beginning, when we had the five people sitting around the room. Um, when those five people, it could be the management team, are, uh, are discussing a proposed investment plan or discussing a proposed um, intervention or asset strategies, they suddenly have defined criteria. They're all speaking the same language. And so they can really debate the pros and the cons of different options. Um, at Copperleaf, we've worked with um, a number of distribution organizations around the world, uh, most not notably in, in Canada and the US, um, where we're, we're, we're based in Vancouver in Canada. Um, but I've been working with European utilities for the last, um, last two or three years, and we're seeing real interest in this area. One of the things that, that we find very interesting is there's a lot of these value models that we see in use at one client can actually be very relevant to another. Um, something like brand perception. Um, even taking examples from outside the electrical distribution space, um, it doesn't necessarily need to be really specific to your organization. And we look to um, bring the knowledge we have of best practice from around the world uh, in working with our clients. Often what we find is it's not a magical answer. It's, it's not as if we've got a really clever formula or anything like that. It's more the confidence of having these models which have been used by organizations to make decisions over a number of years, and they've been successful in, their, in embedding that within their processes. And ultimately, what this enables our, our, our clients to, to support is a, a value-based decision-making process. There's the creation of the value framework, the, the decision-making framework. We're able to support the, the assessment of different options you have in your networks. And then ultimately, you can optimize your, uh, your investment plans, um, looking to understand what's the right timing, what's the right set of options um, to select, and how does that contribute to the values of the organization and, and its stakeholders. So just to finish off a, a couple of examples on the, the benefits of, of doing this, of implementing a, a, a corporate 
decision-making framework. Um, firstly, a very interesting example is actually we've worked with a number of organizations that having developed these frameworks, they've then gone and evaluated all of their projects that they currently had against these criteria, and they realized a huge amount of them were not adding any value at all. And they were able to say, well, we don't need to do these. Um, and that was a significant saving immediately. The, the example here was from a, a US distribution organization. And 2% and of the value of their investment plan wasn't adding value to the organization. The, the example actually says 2 to 5% because there was another 3% where we couldn't find anyone who even would attempt to justify why they were doing those investments. <laughs> so that was uh, a, a pretty uh, uh, convincing uh, reason to, to believe that they weren't adding any value. We've also done um, some research recently with the uh, University of Southampton here in the UK, where we're looking to quantify the benefits of optimizing an investment portfolio compared to uh, prioritizing against a single criteria. And that's shown um, some quite significant results. I think the, the key benefits of having these decision-making criteria is around making better decisions. Um, but it also supports um, a smoother, a more transparent and collaborative process. I talk to lots of organizations that, um, that have to replan. Things change. They've spent a lot of time developing a plan. But six months later, something's happened. There's been a, um, um, some emergency work. Some projects haven't given, give, been given the right approval. And things have to change. Or new CEOs come in and we have to have a 10% reduction um, across the board. And a lot of people struggle with that because it often means going back to the original spreadsheets which contributed to that plan, rerunning some of that analysis, and it often takes weeks and weeks. And so we're, what we're looking to do is to really um, facilitate that process um, and take the effort away from crunching data from um, taking inputs from, from multiple and uh, multiple different systems and really providing our clients with a, um, a process that allows them to spend their time concentrating on, on making better decisions. So that's a, a brief overview to what we as Copperleaf see as the um, what is a value framework, how does it align within the context of the asset management objectives of the organization, um, and a, a few notes on, on the benefits. Um, very happy to, to take questions immediately afterwards, and then I'll, I'll be around for the rest of the day as well. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, we will now move on with the second presentation.